Oh, that's, um, I didn't, never wanted to be a nurse. Um, I was at university studying communications. I'd left school, I was 18, and I hated it. So I went home and proudly told my mum I was leaving university, and she said, you better get a job or I'm going to throw you out of the house. <laughs> so I um, looked in the paper, and they were looking for nursing students, and I thought, I'll apply. Never thinking they would take me on. I, you know, I had purple, spiky hair. I was 18. I, you know, I was quite rebellious. Went along for the interview and they accepted me and I was shocked. I was thinking, what have I done? Um, went home, told my mum that I was going to become a nurse, a mental health nurse, and um, started and just loved it. Just instantly took to it like a duck to water. And I just thought, oh, OK, I get this. I really like working with people. I'd done some voluntary work before, but in learning disabilities and working with children, never in mental health. I hadn't even a clue what mental health was. Not a clue. Not, I went completely naive. I suppose I've always had good older adult role models in my life. Um, you know, my grandmother, I'm lucky that she's still alive and she still very, very functions very well. She's very old now. Um, she's 102 next week um, and lives at home independently. So I'm very lucky that I've always had good role models. But I just really like that they've got loads to tell you. You know, they're your, they're your boss, they're in charge of you. You've got to kind of do as they want you to do. Um, and that seems to work really well for me that I need to work at their pace and respect that they've got a whole wealth, a whole life, you know, that they either want to share with me or don't want to share. And if they do share it, then that's kind of my privilege. I'm quite privileged to be shared that information. I mean, the one, I suppose I'll talk about the most recent one. I've been nursing for uh, 30 years now. Um, and it happened about two years ago. I was working in specialist care, which is for people who are going to be in care home for the rest of their life and have been put in specialist care because they have behaviour who challenge that challenges the staff they're working with. And I was there as a clinical nurse specialist. And there was a lady who was sat like this. And then the staff were describing getting her up in the morning and saying she was the most difficult person they'd ever looked after. And I was going, really? Are you sure? So I said I would work with them, with her, um, to help get her, you know, assist her get up in the morning and things. This lady didn't walk, she didn't speak. She needed full assistance with all her personal care. She needed assistance to have her food. Um, I mean, she literally did nothing. Um, so I, I went in in the morning and observed the staff and I realised within a nanosecond that they did not speak to her at all. They just rolled her about the bed. And she was furious. There was like a palpable rage came off of her. Um, and she was walloping them and I thought, oh, I would hit you actually. If I, was, if I was her, I would hit you. So my mission was to work out what was happening with this lady. So went in in the morning, started getting her up, and I started talking at her, not with her, but at her, and talking a lot of rubbish, really. I would go in and say, oh, it's raining today, and da 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 da, -da and chat, chat, chat. And I, you know, but tell her what I was doing as I was going along, telling the staff that's what they had to do every time they worked with her. And she just, one day, just looked at me like, shut up. And I thought, yes! <laughs> Yes, I knew there was something inside there. There is no way I'm going to shut up now. So I talked more. Talk, 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 talk. So then I would go in in the morning, I would take in the free paper, and I would plonk it on her knee. And, and get, she, they said, oh, she can't, she can't read it. She had no glasses, got her glasses. Put the paper on her knee, and she used to again glare at me. And I said, well, if you, go, if you want to read it, you need to pick it up and read it, because I'm not holding it for you. And chat, 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 and away I go. And then one day she just picked the paper up and it was in a, like a fit of peak to sp spite me. It was like she... <laughs> and, I was, and then she started kind of sitting up and watching what was happening around the room. And when I was in the sitting room one day, she was kind of just still hadn't spoken. She was just following me around the room like that. And I went... <laughs> she went... <gasps> and started laughing. And I started laughing. 
And the staff were all like, and we were, oh, we've never seen, I wouldn't say her name, but we've never seen her laugh before. <laughs> and so, and I just had this feeling there was more going on with this woman. Anyway, one, and I would just talk and talk to her, and I just, <laughs> I suppose, drive her a bit mad. <laughs> and one day she was sat slumped in her chair like this, she'd wiggled herself down and down. And I just went up and started talking to her. I said, right, come on, we're going to get the hoist. Look, you look really uncomfortable, and da-da-da-da-da, and then I get the hoist, and da da I'm going to sit you up in the chair and make you comfortable. <laughs> and I sat up in the chair, and she looked at me, and she went, thank you. And I burst into tears. And then she looked at me like, why did you cry? <laughs> and I just, it, it was one, it was just, I think after nursing for, at that point, it was 28 years, it was like, yep. What I'm doing, I do well, and this is the reason why I do this, because this lady's life was hellish. She was a shell being done to, being put upon, being labelled. And she was just an object, and she became a person. Um, and from there, she just blossomed and went on and on and on, to the point that she was holding court in the sitting room, chat, 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 chatting. The staff were all like, what has happened? And what we done was we gave her paracetamol. I'd spoken to her niece who lived abroad and she'd phoned up and said, oh, how's my aunt doing? And I said, oh, she's reading The Guardian. She went, no, 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 I'm phoning up my aunt. I, you know, I come and see her for three months. I went, no, no, I know who you're talking about. I bring her in, she used to write for the Guardian. I bring her the Guardian in on a Wednesday because she's a socialist and da, da 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 And it was about taking the time to find out about her life, find out what made her tick. Talk about Margaret Thatcher's death. And she actually, she actually could tell me, you know, she called her the, the milk thief, which a lot of the staff hadn't known about. So I was like, come on then, tell us what that means. And we had a whole chat about that. And, and, and she died. She died last year. Um, but for the last 10 months of her life, it was a pleasure to see her just come alive, I suppose. So I suppose that's my most recent, I would call it sparkling moment in nursing. It really kind of reignited my, my belief in it. I mean, I, I was asked to go and work with the Malaysian Alzheimer's Foundation, um, and I took a three month sabbatical from work. And I was there to, well, there was kind of no clear guidelines of what I had to do when I was there. It was just like, come and work with us for three months and we'll see what happens. As it turned out, I was based in their daycare service. And a lot of the things they do are really, really good that we can learn from. A lot of the things are not so good that we, we you know, that we have to change. Um, so I did lots of working with families. There's, the, there's lots of cultural myths. I wouldn't say they're, they're beliefs, but they're cultural myths that people who live in Asian countries look after their family at home and they care for them and they're accepted. And, and that's not the case. People are excluded because they behave a bit strangely or um, people are ashamed. There's still a lot of stigma around dementia. There's a lot of... Um, strange beliefs that it's kind of something to do with you being a bad person, um, that there's a lot of over-medicating people because you can go to any doctor and, and they, they'll just, any doctor, they'll just write a prescription for whatever, really. I went and visited um, nursing homes and the hospitals, mental health hospitals there, where people are tied to the bed, tied to the chair, locked in rooms with bars under the doors, which was totally heartbreaking. Um, I lived in a nursing, there's only one nursing home for people with dementia in the whole of Malaysia, and I lived there for a week with the patients <laughs> and worked with the staff. So they do 12 hour days, so I did three 12 hour days and stayed. In. And there's lots of things that they do really, really well. They don't have as much, they have no paperwork or bureaucracy. So they're with the patients 24-7. The staff are all there. Um, they know them inside out. You know, if somebody fidgets like that slightly, they're like, oh, I know, what, I know what's wrong with her, you know. So the, the, the residents get lots and lots of attention. The care's very task-orientated, very institutionalised. 
there's no education around dementia care at all. So I was doing lots of hands-on, kind of, come and come and I'll show you how to do this differently. Um, the, the, it, was late, it was all ladies in this home and I had longer hair at the time. It was really hot and humid. This is another sparkling moment, really. And um, I took out some hair clips and some clips and a brush. This lady was agitated and said to her, I sat on the floor and said, could you fix my hair? And the next thing, there was like a group of these women all round deciding how my hair should look. I looked like a troll by the end of it. But they were delighted that I, they'd just made such an effort on my hair. The staff who were all these young girls were looking like, what is she doing? This eminent nurse from London's came over and she's like, and I was like, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> the residents were just ecstatic. So kind of doing that stuff that was a bit outside their kind of norm and saying, you know what, it's okay. It's okay to be a wee bit, <laughs> a wee bit odd or do something a bit strange. If it makes your person happy, just do it. Um, but, Again, they really care about the patients. They, you know, they just, they are the tiniest wee women I've ever seen in my life. They're about that height and tiny. But they have no equipment. They're, but they all, there's no complaints. They smile. They're really proud of the work that they do. And that's, that's something I think we've lost here. Okay. If I could walk 500 miles, not just because, well, because I do lots of charity walks for breast cancer. So I do the moon walks. Last year I did three. Um, I did London, Edinburgh and Iceland. And I've raised in total about £5,000 for breast cancer. So I do a lot of walking. And also it's about, it's a very Scottish song. <laughs> I think it could be the unofficial Scottish national anthem by the Proclaimers. Um, but it's about going forward and striving and achieving and looking ahead and, and it's quite an upbeat positive song and I think on the whole I'm quite a positive upbeat person so that's what I would pick. Well I suppose I always ha I have lots of women in my life who inspire me and most of them are not famous, they're friends or family or um, my grandmother inspires me, you know, this incredible, and she frustrates me because she's so independent that I think she's just, she just doesn't annoy me. But um, she just is incredible. She's lived through so much, she's lived through two world wars, through a God knows how many flu pandemics. She's robust, she's healthy. She has had losses in her life. She's seen the world change dramatically to something that, you know, is completely outworth her realms of normality when she was younger. And she's just kind of gone with it. She's just as incredible. She'll say to me, how's your partner? You know, how's Andrew doing? You know, and she, and she just accepts all these changes that people now don't get married and they live together and, you know, people are gay. But she says to me, well, they may never had that when, <coughs> when I was young. And I they, they did, granted, it was illegal though. But now it's just like, you know, everything she just accepts in her life. And she's kind of, she's very stoic and very strong. So I suppose that she's someone who I really admire in my life. Depending on what I wanted to do, I would, I, I would go, I love up at Loch Lomond. It's a place called Luss, tiny wee village, very peaceful. There's nothing really there, but it's just really peaceful and beautiful to sit and just look out of the water and just let your brain drift away, your thoughts drift away. And I always feel really contented when I'm there. And this weekend, I'm going to one of my favourite places in the world, which is my friend's cottage. Um, and it's in Scotland, in a place called Glenluis. It's a tiny wee stone cottage. And myself and four of my girlfriends are going to celebrate a hen weekend there. So there was lots of very happy memories in this cottage and this will be a riot this weekend. <laughs> I suppose that's quite changeable, my favourite music. It depends on what mood I'm in. Just now, I, 
this is going to sound ridiculous, but there's a song by Pharrell Williams called Happy from Despicable Me, and it just puts me in a really good mood. It makes me dance around my house, like nobody's watching. So I put me an iPod on and I dance, like, much to the amusement of my partner who just looks and shakes his head, but it makes me happy. I've got lots of pieces of art, actually, and I really... I'm sure people wouldn't think this of me. I've got quite a lot of original pieces of art in my house. It's something that I, I buy and collect and really, really enjoy. Um, I don't know if I've got a favourite piece. I like Henry Moore. I love the feel of his sculptures and the lines, and they feel really tranquil and smooth. <laughs> I love The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> And I watch it every Christmas. <laughs> every Christmas would not be Christmas if I didn't watch The Wizard of Oz. What is it about? I think it reminds me of when I was a child. My mum, we used to all sit as a family and watch it. It became a bit of a tradition. Um, <clears throat> and then I just, yeah, so I, I watch The Wizard of Oz. I just love it. I don't have any memorabilia I may add around my house. I'm not that sad, but I do watch it every Christmas. <laughs> I don't have red sparkly shoes or anything like that. Okay, I think um, I'm self-aware. I'm aware of my foibles, of which I have many. Um, but I'm aware of them, and, I, you know, and I'm quite honest, I'm very honest actually. I'm very straight, direct, honest. What you see is what you get. There's no hidden agenda. I think that, I've got a, I think that stands me in good stead. People kind of respect that, they know where I'm coming from. I think my main thing is I've got a really good sense of humour. I laugh at a lot of things, I find things quite funny that maybe other people wouldn't find that funny. I find something quite funny about it. I laugh a lot, and I think people who I'm with laugh a lot. So um, I'm a storyteller in lots of ways. So on a night out with friends, I will often be the person telling the funny story, usually about something that's happened to me. I mean, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, so I'm quite kind of, I'm aware of things like that. I think having a, a very small family, but actually my my friends and my support system and my network and the people who who know me best and know what makes me tick. I was aware of that when I was in Malaysia. I had this sudden thought of, because the roads are really busy there, and I thought, if I'm knocked down by a car, no one will know what I, who I am. So when I was doing one of the training sessions, I put a picture up of a brain, a comedy brain, but I had lots of things about it that was my person and said, if I could knock down my car, could you take this in the accident emergency, please? And say, this is the kind of things that make Linda Linda. Some of them are really trivial, like I wear perfume every day. Um, I'm not a morning person. Um, I... Oops, I think my friends are very important within it. I'm quite organised, I quite like structure, I like to plan ahead. People who know me would say, oh, my partner would say, I'm the most disorganised person in the world. But that's when I'm at home. When I'm at work, it's different. My work is very important to me. Feeling that I do a good job is one of the things that really makes me tick. If I feel I'm not doing a good job, it makes me unha really unhappy, really dissatisfied and kind of out of kilter. And that good job could just be somebody smiling at me at work. You know, somebody who's been miserable winking at me. That could be enough to make my day. So, hope that's enough. That's perfect. Thank, Thank you very much.